Welcome to episode 68 of Red Hoop Talk, the native news and talk show. Uh, I am Shannon O'Loughlin, a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, and your host for this wonderful evening. And I hope uh, everyone is doing well out there in Indian country and um, there's no other places in between. There's only Indian country and there's only being indigenous every damn day. So uh, welcome to all of you who are joining us. Uh, as you know, our uh, wonderful show is produced by the Association on American Indian Affairs, uh, the oldest nonprofit serving Indian country since 1922. Um, as I said, my name is Shannon. I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, and I'm coming to you live from the lands of the Piscataway people. Uh, so welcome. I hope everyone can give us a shout out in the chat room. Let us know where you're coming from. Uh, we're, we've got it going live on our YouTube channel, on Facebook Live, and on our Twitter account. So, so it's out there somewhere. I'm sure you're, you're going to find it somewhere. <laughs> um, let's see. I have a nice little, uh, uh, script over here and I hate, I hate using scripts. I, I get, uh, I get too caught up in the words and paying attention to those. And, and I forget what I'm really wanting to talk about tonight. And there's a lot to talk about our 68th episode tonight is going to be about indigenous food sovereignty and we have some wonderful guests with us and we're going to learn more about our guests and about indigenous food sovereignty this evening but i wanted to bring you some important news that's been going on since last we spoke way back in episode 67. Um, i don't know if you all heard yet or not but uh, president biden signed three executive orders this afternoon uh, that released the stranglehold that the Trump administration had put on our national monuments, especially on Bears Ears. So now Bears Ears has been restored to its full um, original uh, monument size as Obama had originally intended. So yay, that was uh, good stuff. Um, uh, President Biden said it was the easiest thing he's ever done. Um, not sure about that, President Biden. It's only taken you 10 months to do it. So, uh, but we're glad you did. We're very happy that you did. Uh, welcome, Kelly, from Northern Virginia. Everyone, please give us a shout out where you you're coming from, whose land you are um, standing on, and and where you're where you're coming from. Uh, in addition to Bears Ears, um, if you know uh, September 30th and what that day stands for, it is uh, a special day to many of us in Indian country. Uh, it's the National Day of Remembrance for U.S. Indian boarding schools. And on that day, uh, a new act was announced in Congress um, that's being vetted up the pole, so to speak. Uh, Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding School Policies in the United States Act. It's a long damn ass name, um, uh, but it was put forward by uh, Senator Warren, Congresswoman Davids, and even, yes, even Tom Cole uh, put forward that piece of legislation that will help um, uh, investigate and put an end to uh, the hopefully the continuing historic trauma that uh, boarding school uh, assimilation policies um, did in Indian country. Wow, I'm just like, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm tripping over my words a little bit today. Um, thanks everyone for coming. I see Gigi by the sea. I see Victor Perez. I'm, I'm glad you're all, you all are with us tonight. And pardon me for being a little bit... Um, uh, I feel like I'm a little bit out of practice. We're not doing Red Hoop Talk every week, and I feel like this is all new to me, so I have to get back in the, the swing of things, so I hope you're patient, um, and I hope everyone's celebrating that, you know, there's a possibility to have this truth and, and reconciliation 
uh, commission here in the United States regarding boarding schools. So please uh, Google that a bit and read what's going on there. Um, also, what's happening on Monday is Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, the White House um, wrote this very nice, beautiful uh, declaration that's on, um, where is it at? A proclamation um, on, um, on the White House briefing room. You can find it there. Uh, it's very nicely done. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I remember whether the Trump administration had done, um, had done these proclamations uh, or if he was mostly focusing on uh, job creation and other kind of Republican ideals. Uh, but this is a nice uh, proclamation recognizing not just inherent sovereignty, but how important our, our culture and self-determination is over uh, our own uh, governing our lands, governing our cultures, governing our education. Uh, so it's a nice, nice proclamation. Uh, what's even more interesting um, is, yes, that's right, Kelly, Trump focused on Columbus and Columbus Day. Um, uh, so we're happy to see that um, this is happening. And what else happened in Congress related is Senators Heinrich, Lujan, and Torres introduced bicameral legislation to commemorate and celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. And expressly in that act is doing away with all mention of Columbus and Columbus Day. That is, that is huge. Um, among, with, uh, um, among all these other things that are happening uh, in Congress and in the administration, this, these are big changes that are happening very quickly. Uh, it's good, but it's it's kind of scary, and I wonder if if it's a pendulum that'll go far way over here, and then by the time the next administration comes in, it'll swing way over the other way next time. Now, you know, if you spend any time with us on Red Hoop Talk, back when uh, Roy was my co-host, he'd always get pissed off at me that I was so negative, but when you've been dealing in federal Indian law and policy uh, for decades like I have, it, it just always seems to go that way. So, hey, things are great. Let's hold on and make them as strong as possible because there always seems to be that pendulum swing swinging the other way. I sure hope we're entering another age of Aquarius or something that's going to um, bring people more at peace instead of taking positions against indigenous peoples in our lands. But uh I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much a skeptic of humanity. I don't know how you all think. Um, but uh, since we're talking about um, things to be upset about, I wanted to share with you some information that I learned recently from a good friend of mine um, uh, um, who's uh, also a fellow Choctaw. And let me see if I can bring it up in... Um, our share. So give me a second here. There we go. Um, I'm sure you all heard about um, Hurricane, Hurricane Ida uh, back at the end of uh, August that really decimated the um, uh, southeastern part of the United States through Louisiana. And if you've ever been in, into those areas, there's small um, uh, uh, native and indigenous and, and, and other communities that are living in and who rely on uh, uh, fishing uh, for subsistence and for economic development. And climate change has just really destroyed uh, uh, their land base as well as the environment and what fish they're able to catch and, and sustain themselves. Um, well, uh, the hurricane uh, really just destroyed um, different communities there in, in Louisiana. Uh, Point of Chen Indian tribe, which is a state recognized tribe. Um, there's a GoFundMe page. Uh, I am encouraging everyone to do a little digging on the communities that are in the southeastern United States, the small communities that are losing land like those in uh, Louisiana. 
Let me paste this here. Uh, and uh, and if you've got a couple of bucks to give, um, send it their way. Uh, the way this, the federal and state and local governments are treating these, these small indigenous communities there in the Southeast is just horrendous. And it's been really, really hard for them to get any um, uh, clean water, any trailers or other kind of shelter help or, or support um, uh, down in these areas. So um, we're sending good thoughts out to all of you um, who've been damaged by Hurricane Ida and climate change. Um, now that I've depressed all of us, <laughs> let me get back to uh, saying welcome again to our 68th episode. I'm so grateful to be here. And I also want everyone, I want everyone out there to join us for our seventh annual repatriation conference. I'm going to share one more screen and then we're going to get to our guests. All right. So let me find it. We'll go back to... Um, here we are, uh, our seventh annual repatriation conference. I want to turn your attention to um, our scholarships that are available. You can attend our conference for free if you simply fill out, it will take you less than five minutes, a scholarship form, and, and we can get you registered for free to attend the conference. Now, the conference is about the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. It's about those things that uh, NAGPRA doesn't apply to, like when private collectors and auction houses try to, to, to market our uh, sacred objects and, and funerary objects and cultural items. Uh, it's about international repatriation and how we seek our cultural heritage back from institutions all around the world. There's some great people that are going to be a part of, of this conference. And it's not just a, a few conference days that are boring. Um, it's actually going to be a series of events taking place from November 1st through November 19th. Uh, and all of the events will be recorded. So if you missed something you, you wanted to um, see, you can go back and, and watch it later. Um, and like I said, you can do that for free. So go to... Um, Indian-affairs.org conference scholarships, plural conference scholarships, and uh, please apply for a scholarship. And I'm going to put it in the um, chat too. And I also forgot to um, spell out the GoFundMe page uh, for uh, Point O'Shane Indian Tribe. Um, the GoFundMe page is gofundme.com backslash F backslash Ida, I-D-A dash relief dash four dash point O'Shane, P-O-I-N-T-E-A-U-C-H-I-E-N dash Indian dash tribe. So GoFundMe, Point O'Shane Indian tribe. Um, hopefully you can Google that and find that. Um, uh, Thanks everyone for putting up with all my announcements. I hope now you're actually ready for <laughs> something fun and interesting. I have two wonderful guests with us um, tonight to talk about uh, indigenous food sovereignty. But before that, I really hope we can spend some time getting to know them. I'm gonna bring up here uh, Dr. Andrea Carter. Hi, Andrea. Hello. And and Carly Griffith Hotbet. How are you, Carly? I'm great. How are you? Good. Looks like you've been to court or something. It's been a day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, welcome to Red Hoop Talk. We're so glad to have you as guests. Now, I didn't do a very good job of, of detailing an introduction for you, but let me let me let me say a little bit about uh, Dr. Carter here. Um, uh, she works at Native Seed Search in Tucson, Arizona, and she's a uh, Powhatan Renape, uh, which is a state-recognized tribe in New Jersey. Um, so for all you folks out there from New Jersey who think there's no Indians, um, uh, uh, Dr. Carter can tell you different. 
Um, she is educated up the yin yang. Uh, she has her uh, degree from Cornell as well as, as well as a doctorate at the University of Arizona. She spent a lot of time working on um, uh, agriculture issues and, and uh, do you call yourself a scientist, Andrea? Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, so I can you, so. can you introduce yourself better than, than what I've done here? Well, you did pretty good, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for that. Um, but yes, as, as you mentioned, um, I'll start with my background. Like you said, a member of the Poetan Renape Nation of New Jersey, we exist there. Um, and um, and then on my mother's side, I'm from North Africa. My mom is from Tunisia, a small country in North Africa, and we're Berber, um, which are the indigenous people of North Africa. Um, and so that's my, my mom and my dad's side. Um, He's African American, and, and we're members of the Poetan Nation, um, which are, are members of, of different tribes that made up the once Poetan Confederacy and that relocated right outside of Philadelphia to a, a community there. Um, so that is my, my lineage. And in terms of my scientific career, as you mentioned, um, I did my doctorate in plant science. And as I mentioned, with my, where my mother is from is a desert, arid landscape. And from a young age, I knew I wanted to be involved in agriculture. But going over there showed me, man, drought is an issue that we're going to have to deal with. And they had been dealing with it. And it impacted ways of life over there um, significantly in the past few decades. So I came out here to Arizona, where I currently am on the traditional homelands of the Odom and Pasquayaki people and studied at the University of Arizona and looked at the physiology of, of plants that are adapted to low water conditions. What is it about certain crops that allows them to be able to grow without much water? That was my focus. And, and so overall arid land agriculture is, is my focus. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, for that. And, and um, um, uh, Miss Carly Griffith, hot vet, and I love her last name, hot vet. I really like it. Want to, yeah, give it some emphasis there, um, is a lawyer. Um, and so I was, I was not, um, I was being literal. She's actually been in court today and that's why mm -hmm. she looks like uh, a, a very professional lawyer right now. So thanks for, for joining us after after all that. Um, and Carly works at the, um, out of the, is it ne University of Nebraska? Uh, University of Arkansas. Arkansas, Arkansas, sorry. Um, University of Arkansas um, at the um, Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative. Um, and you're a, a, a director? Or I'm the associate a, director. That's mm -hmm. right, associate director. Uh, there. And um, can you tell us, and, and you're a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, sorry, Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. I'm really flubbing this up bad. So you guys are going to have to do a lot of talking because I am, uh, uh, I, I, I must have some like um, peanut butter stuck on my tongue or something. Um, uh, so Carly, you're a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. Yes. Um, and so how did you uh, get involved uh, in this path towards law and, and, and indigenous foods? Yeah. Um, first, let me introduce myself. I like to take the chance to speak Cherokee when I can. So Osio Nagata, Carly Hotva, Dagudoa, Chi Chalagi, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Jigega. Hello, everyone. My name is Carly Hotvet. Um, I am Cherokee and I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm currently residing on the reservation of the Muscogee Creek Nation and traditional homelands of Osage Nation in Wichita. So very excited to be here and be super immersed in uh, Indian country. But to get back to your point, um, this job kind of landed in my lap in the most fortuitous way. Um, I get to use all of my degrees every single day in the work that I do. So I have bachelor's degrees in political science and ag business, um, a master's degree in public administration, and of course my law degree. 
Um, we are kind of a uh, tribal ag policy think tank and really collaborate with tribes and federal policymakers to advance uh, indigenous agriculture and uh, nutrition in the United States. So we get to work with any and every tribe that hollers at us. Um, we are exceptionally well funded by some very generous donors and grantors. So we get to do great work for free on behalf of tribes. And I'm just thrilled for that opportunity. Um, yeah. <laughs> so what, what made you follow that path? Was there something in your, your history that, that led yeah. you down that road? Sure. So I spent most of my summers with my grandparents um, on a farm in eastern Oklahoma, um, northeast of Tulsa, and raised hogs, sowed hogs. Um, we ended up moving back to Oklahoma from Washington State uh, for me to start high school and then became really involved in FSA. And my grandpa, um, who um, is my turkey side of the family, um, taught ag all over Oklahoma. Um, so really had a great time um, being, you know, raised up under him and being well connected through agriculture circles. And the tight knit community really led me to pursuing that as a degree at Oklahoma State. Um, and I double majored while I was there. So kind of came along, always knew I wanted to go to law school. So I did that afterwards. But when I got out, I never thought I'd be working in agriculture again. Um, but I ended up um, interning for a couple of municipalities. So really like the government law aspect, getting to see how setting good policy on the front end really can prevent a lot of problems on the back end. And uh, ended up working that was so and uh, caught a really weird grant that came across my desk. And I flagged it to the Secretary of Interior Affairs at the time, which is um, the department that ran the ag programs and it involved the ag programs. And I said, I don't think this is going to work. There's a couple things in here that, you know, isn't going to be a good fit just based on my knowledge of agriculture. And he said, why don't you come over here and run these programs? So came over, reorganized, created the division of agriculture under that department, um, vertically integrated uh, some of Muscogee Creek Nation's uh, agriculture assets in order to make them work better together instead of um, kind of uh, floundering around independently. But that was awesome. And, you know, I started looking around, I was like, I wonder if I can, you know, do this and take it to the next level and had a chance to work with the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative staff um, during the uh, negotiations for Farm Bill 2018. Learned about their programs, loved what they did. They had a spot come open. So I asked to join them and they actually ended up creating another position specifically for me to do, uh, to be the director of uh, tribal enterprise, to do outreach for tribes and help them scale up their ag program. So I feel incredibly lucky to have the opportunity to do this kind of work and really be influential and instrumental in advancing good policy in a good way for tribes. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. Well, there's no uh, uh, freaking absence of, of education in this room right now. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that. Um, uh, you know, I'm I'm just a a, a lawyer, um, and um, and what I always ask other lawyers this, Carly, and I have to ask this. So Andrea, um, we're going to get back That's to lawyer talk. Let's see. Native cert. So so you actually said that you always wanted to be a lawyer. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I wanted to, you know, when I was in high school, I was like, maybe I want to be a doctor. And then I got to college and took my first biochemistry class. And I was like, what? no. So, but I had gone to girl state the summer before that, or, you know, during my junior year. And I loved it. Love government aspect, loving how to make policy work and, you know, interact and how to, um, you know, leverage and influence um, things to be, make, make your society and environment better. Um, just based on the work that you do as a person. So um, love that. And so I was looking, you know, how can I, you know, transition this into something that makes sense? And I knew I wanted to help people. I wanted to be in a helping field or a service field. So being an attorney and helping people with legal issues um, sounded like a really good time to me. So yeah, since freshman year of college, it was um, set after that. So why do you think so many Indians like to go to law school? Like, why does that seem to be where most of us uh, fly to? I think that, you know, we really recognize that there's a need for attorneys that have that fundamental understanding of um, 
tribal sovereignty and the concept mm -hmm. of what that means in relation to, you know, living in um, a, a country that um, is very heavily influenced and would not exist but for tribes um, mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the land base um, acquired from them. But there's just a real fundamental misunderstanding of the role that tribal sovereignty plays, um, not only in his, the historical context, but in modern context as well. And it's critical for us to be able to support, you know, our tribes and tribal governments by really advancing those sovereignty interests. And we know sovereignty doesn't just touch on, you know, just government. That sovereignty really applies to, you know, food and personal security and, you um, you know, political decision making and natural resource sovereignty. So there are a lot of layers associated with that. And I think so many indigenous folks go to law school because they know that there, A, there's a huge need, but B, there's a ton of opportunities available to them when we come out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there is. There is. So, so you didn't feel like you had to, um, it is a, a very difficult place to thrive. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, the Socratic method and, and the, the way in which lawyers are educated, uh, what I call, um, it's a school to create assholes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, I think true. I think that's true because they tell you, you know, you are not only do you have all the responsibility, you also have all the, um, you know, power that comes along with that. And I think that's like the balance of your ethics versus your ability to direct and control your situation. So yeah, it's kind of like that surgeon mentality. Like you, you know, the law, you argue the law, you play God a little bit and sometimes it goes to your head. <laughs> um, yeah. And, um, and my friend Sunny from, from Hawaii is laughing because she's also an attorney, um, and uh, we like to about to talk about our our asshole attorney friends. But anyway, <laughs> let's move back to food sovereignty and and um, Andrea, what you do at Native Seed Search seems to really get your hands dirty. So you're not just um, uh, you're not just book learning. You are actually you've used your education to actually change things on the ground to protect seeds and, and to create opportunities for indigenous foods. So can you talk a little bit about what Native Seed Search is and what it is you do there? All right, happily. So and I'll bring up the website while you're doing that. I'll bring oh, up the cool. website. Oh, cool, great, yeah. Native Seed Search is a nonprofit located in Tucson whose mission is to conserve and promote the arid adopted crop diversity of the Southwest. And most of the crops in the collection are from indigenous communities of the Southwest and Northwest Mexico, right? So um, a lot of our work is connecting people to those seeds, right? That they are within community. Um, and we do this through distributing seeds. So you'll see on our website, we sell seeds, but we also really the core of our work are our free seed access programs. And so these involve community seed grants to school gardens or community garden organizations that are working in food security. Um, we provide 30 free seed packets. We also do a Native American seed request for 10 free packets for individuals of Southwest tribes or Native American individuals currently living in the Southwest. And then we do a partner farmer program where we provide bulk quantities of seeds to small scale farmers throughout the Southwest at no cost. And we ask for a portion of that harvest to come back to Native seeds. Um, and that's to replenish our stocks and, and the collection. That collection of Native seeds includes close to 1900 different varieties of crops. So it's extensive and it's it's been a beautiful experience just to be exposed to the diversity that is present within Southwest cultures when it comes to food crops. We also have some crop, crop wild relatives, but really it's the food crops. And it's it speaks to the that tie of, of agriculture to culture 
you know, how ingrained that is and the effort that went into it of people over generations selecting seeds that were not just um, for food, but that it's also a matter of it being adapted to the conditions of the Southwest, which is can often be an inhospitable climate for growing, right? We're, we've got low water, we've got high pH soils, it's challenging, and yet these many of these crops thrive in these conditions. So you know, the, the mission of the organization is really to conserve these crops and that diversity and then getting those crops out to people. So um, any, anyone can request or purchase some of these seeds and that help goes toward uh, the work of Native that's Seed that's Search, that's right? That's um, it, yeah. That's great, that's great. Uh, so. Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, I found it really interesting when I started to learn about how, how farming and current agriculture as, as well as livestock um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 manufacturing um, mm -hmm. uh, has damaged our soils mm -hmm. uh, and damaged our soils in such a way uh, that is creating climate change because the soil is unable to really suck up the the carbon, um, yeah, correct. The, yeah. the carbon uh, uh, dioxide, the CO2 in the atmosphere, yes. totally, yeah. Um, and so is the work that you're doing in seed search and the work from your um, your experience as, as a scientist, um, how is that does that apply to the Southwest? Because it's already an arid, dusty place. So mm -hmm. uh, when I think of soil, mm -hmm. I don't think of the desert, right? Sure. What is it? What is the desert soil like? What are the, the nutrients that are there? Is it different than uh, here in the East or Midwest um, where we are? Yes, it is different. So out here we have really mineral rich soils mm -hmm. and that's great for agriculture and it's great for producing nutrient dense food, right? Because we've got the, the nutrients in there, the, uh, the magnesium, the calcium, like it's, it's very nutrient rich. Whereas on the East Coast, because of all that rain, what often happens is you leach out a lot of those nutrients. Right. So like in the rainforest, this is an issue. A lot of rain leaches out nutrients and you get acidic soil. And I won't go into our, our soil science class, but they are different. So we have um, a really nutrient rich soil. But at the same time, there's that drought issue, right? The lack of water availability and what soils need to be microbially active and to start doing that carbon se sequestration is moisture right to start working that but that can be increased by organic matter that we're putting in the soil and so part of our work is working with farmers to to encourage sustainable and and soil building production practices but the great thing about many of the farmers we work with this is not new to them right regenerative agriculture sustainable agriculture organic agriculture these are the creators of these practices that especially the native farmers right particularly that i'm working with um, throughout the southwest these are not new practices these are the creators of these practices mm -hmm. and so it's really just a matter oftentimes it's a matter of helping facilitate that continuation of traditional agriculture practices that do are that are rooted in building the soil and conserving soil moisture um, and, and maintaining and promoting crop productivity. So um, we're just really trying to facilitate and make sure there's the support for, for a continuation of these good practices that have been occurring for thousands of years in this region. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the farmers and how, um, is this just in the Southwest um, that you're working with farmers? Is it beyond that? Primarily for our partner farmers, it is in the Southwest. Now our partnership with growers is based on that we have a, a, a need for the regeneration or the growing out of crops within that collection. And that's to maintain their health, 
um, to maintain their quantity and to be working with communities to make sure that these seeds are present. So I have a few growers I'll work with that are, and that we as an organization work with that are outside of that Southwest region, primarily because the need for growing out these seeds is, is there, right? So if we've got a grower who's, um, I've got one wonderful woman in Milwaukee who is also, um, a, she's an urban farmer, but she's providing food to the urban Indian community of, of Milwaukee. She's an herbalist. I'm happy to work with her. And often they're crops that are in our collection that are suited to that environment. So um, I have one woman, Cherokee Amanda Ross, outside of Asheville, who I'm working with, who's growing some beans with us. So uh, we definitely are open to it because we have that need and also want to support the sharing of seeds and, and um, the distribution of them and the involvement of native farmers kind of nationwide. That being said, our core base and focus is those Southwest growers, primarily because these seeds are of their community. Wow. Wow. Um, uh, so Lance has a good question in the chat about um, how, you know, protecting the seeds and patenting the seeds. Mm -hmm. so Carly, we may come back to you with that question, but Carly, can you talk a little bit more about the initiative and the work that's happening there? Is it more academic, um, higher level? Is it uh, working on the ground? Just uh, talk a little bit more about the work there. Sure, so we have a wide spectrum of activities that we engage in, um, very involved and embedded, um, not only with you know USDA programming to benefit um, indigenous producers, but also, you know, working directly with tribes on the ground, consulting with them to develop their own model tribal food and agriculture codes um, or develop the, their codes based on our model tribal food and agriculture code. We also create resources um, intended to target uh, tribal producers for our, and tribal governments and native youth who are interested in getting involved um, by providing them more information and contextualization of some opportunities available to them. And a lot of times, you know, these resources may already exist in the mainstream, but they're not particularly focused on the needs and nuances of Indian country. So um, really try and put those together. The other thing we do in component with, um, you know, policy work is we are the policy partner for the Native Farm Bill Coalition. Mm -hmm. So um, in the 2018 Farm Bill really worked a lot on, um, you know, drafting policy and circulating that to our stakeholders and reflecting their voices and their needs in that update, which we'll be doing again next year in 2022 in contemplation of Farm Bill 2023. So uh, I actually just did an on-farm readiness review visit um, for a farm that's interested in pursuing um, food, uh, certification under the Food Safety Modernization Act. And so I do get to get out in the field. That's one of my favorite things to do is, you know, get outside and uh, meet with tribes and tribal producers and help them get access to the resources they need to take their operation where they want it to go. So talk about, can you talk a little bit about how um, the law in agriculture has changed and included indigenous farmers over time? Um, where has that change come from? Has it just been from Indian country or, um, how was how have indigenous farmers been recognized um, in the law? All right, get ready. We're going back to pre-contact. <laughs> Let's do it. So, um, in pre-contact, you know, there were a lot of different you know food systems that we were able to access in order to feed ourselves, and you know, different tribes were in different locations and access different food resources. Um, Plains tribes, um, you know, follow the buffalo quite frequently. Um, in addition. To to, you know, other um, types of um, hunting opportunities. Other tribes were already agrarian and producing, and we know that uh, because of evidence by uh, spiral mounds and Cahokia mounds and those large concentrations of um, indigenous populations, you had to grow your own food in order to feed that many people in that location. So um, agricultural practices are not new to indigenous peoples. I mean, we've been here since time immemorial. We figured out how to feed ourselves just fine. Mm -hmm. When content, when European contact started, um, we started getting pushed off of, you know, our um, homelands and becoming separated or constrained in our access to our um, traditional and culturally relevant food resources. And as we've seen, um, you know, colonialism advance and additional um, 
removal and concentration of our land base to smaller and smaller um, parcels, uh, that's become a critical issue. And it's resulted uh, many times in a dependency on federal nutrition programs. And prior to even getting to that point, um, we know that federal Indian policy, especially in the 1800s, um, really used food policy to manipulate tribes into coercing them into agreeing to certain policies or issues. Um, just a couple of, of examples, um, Navajo Nation had an experience where um, there was a component of um, their tribal citizens and tribal warriors who were um, rebelling, quote unquote, against the uh, U.S. government that was there. And instead of you know taking up arms and fighting, uh, the federal government burned crops and destroyed food sources in order to coerce um, you know the end to that type of rebellion. The Modoc tribe, uh, certain members of the Modoc tribe were on the run and hiding in the lava pits and the um, U.S. Uh, Army uh, essentially starved them out, you know, cut off their food sources in order to um, get them to um, essentially do what they wanted them to do. And there are endless examples of things like this occurring with regard to food policy where um, we were either undersupplied or cut off from our resources or had our food resources destroyed and nothing was substituted. And that experience has continued, but it's resulted in kind of the perspective that we see today, wherein we're separated from our food culture and food traditions, um, not only through you know that type of policy, but also through the boarding school era where we were our kids, children were separated from um, adults and being able to receive and um, retain that cultural indigenous food knowledge, either um, you know, for medicine or for um, cultural practices or just for, um, you know, regular community living and eating foods that you like and enjoy. And that has really been impactful because we haven't been able to, you know, share those food cultures and food traditions like we like. But we've seen a resurgence and a return to um, really paying attention to what's important and how to bring that cultural standpoint back to our food connectivity. So with that in mind, we really um, try to support, you know, federal programs that give opportunities to tribes in the context that is the best fit for them. So a lot of times it was, oh, well, there's already these loan programs in place. Why don't you access those to help? Well, we're on trust land. We're on restricted land. We don't necessarily have the same kind of collateral opportunities that will allow us to access loans. Um, there's also, you know, infrastructure challenges on an in Indian country across multiple reservations um, that tend to be, you know, more rural and uh, getting access to irrigation opportunities or even uh, electricity. And now broadband is becoming a critical issue towards accessing markets. So we take a look at these kind of through the lens of Indian country and figure out what policies need to be changed and how can we change them to be a better fit for tribal agriculture. And so when we look at the 2018 Farm Bill, it's the biggest omnibus bill that Congress passes. The 2018 Farm Bill, we were able to include 63 specific provisions to incorporate tribes to allow them, the or tribal producers, to allow them the opportunity to participate in programs that they were previously excluded from, to um, access set-asides for socially disadvantaged farmers to be identified in a less competitive funding um, pool, and um, you know, there's a variety of other resources, or excuse me, other policies that have been tweaked, and you can review that in the Regaining Our Future report. So that's just kind of, uh, you know, 30,000 foot example. And if, you know, we want to really nerd out about conservation or production agriculture or, you know, ag marketing, there are so many different facets where there are significant nuances in Indian country that we can make policy changes in to be really impactful um, for our tribal food economies. Wow. So when I think of, so this is how I've experienced um, indigenous food sources and the huge change that's happened over the last 50 years on how we look at food. Um, and I don't know, you, you both may be a little too young to have experienced um, uh, uh, commodity foods. Um, mm -hmm. uh so, you know, my family was raised on uh, commods, <laughs> lots of cheese, lots of cheese, <laughs> um, and loved that cheese. Still, if I had That's a big block of it today, I, I, would, I would go to town on that, that cheese. 
um, grilled cheese sandwiches for days. Um, and, 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 and that shit that we were given to eat, um, and it's known to have created just a, a, a epidemic of diabetes. I mean, our health, uh, even until today, is still affected by that, that intergenerational um, uh, destruction of our connection to the earth and the foods that we use as medicine, because we all know now um, that's what they are um, and they can kill us or they can heal us. Um, yeah. And then over the last, uh, I went to school at the University of Arizona. I went to law school and, and got my master's degree there. And that's when I first learned about the native seed search. And I'm like, wow, what? There's, there's other things that used to be here. There are more nutritional uh, available foods that have been um, um, altered that I haven't had access to that were part of uh, uh, how we used to feed ourselves. I had no clue. And it's so amazing to see the resurgence, to see pictures of corn that are actually corn, um, beautiful colors. And I, and I still look at it today and go, what would that taste like? Because all I know is that damn white and yellow corn. Right. Um, And, and so uh, Andrea, can you kind of talk about some of these foods and, and their values and um, uh, just more about how important they are. Sure. I think it's a big sense of pride. That's something I've encountered with the, the growers we work with and, and the feedback I get, especially from the community gardens that are working with children. Mm-hmm. The sense of pride felt when one learns of a crop of their people and go, what? there's an Apache red corn, there's a Apache red sorghum and it's nine feet tall and delicious and beautiful. That really does something, I think, to people. And that pride is invaluable to, and that reconnection of knowing that this part of your culture, who you are and a thankfulness and an, um, an awe at ancestors who created these beautiful varieties. If you look at what um, corn, the progenitor of corn, they say is teosinte, which that's what the scientists have said, you know, down in central Mexico, it's a bushy little plant with like few little kernels. Those are native farmers over millennia that selected and, and traded and moved and adapted so that you can now have corn growing in upstate New York that's super suited to those conditions and then have corn that grows up at Hopi. And it does perfectly well, even in those dry yet mineral rich soils up there. And that's the seeds that can do that. So yes, this, you know, going back to the seeds being different, it's like, or the soils, it's the adaptedness of the seeds um, is so impressive to see. And that speaks to the adaptedness of people. Like we're unique to place that we're land-based people. and and same with our crops. So that would be what I've really seen is pride that comes through that rediscovery of, of one's crops. That, that's amazing. Go Shannon, ahead, I'm, glad you, yeah, I'm glad you brought up commodities and um, Andrea, thank you for you know sharing about, you know, the, the cultural connection that we have with our mm-hmm. So the commodities program is an example of one of those federal nutrition programs that tribes really leverage a lot of times um, to help feed their people. And we've Mm -hmm. seen um, in the 2018 Farm Bill, there's a pilot project that um, tribes were able to apply for in order to self-source the foods in that commodities bundle. Mm So previously, a lot of these foods were not consistent with, you know, good diets intended for indigenous people, you know, higher glycemic indexes, lots of sugar, Mm -hmm. lots of things like that. So under this, and when I say 638 pilot, 638 is the law that allows um, self-administration. So instead of the federal government or a state administering it, it allows a tribe to self-administer these programs. So it's like, we got this, you just give us the money and let us run it. In this instance, tribes are able to source 
um, culturally relevant and, you know, traditionally specific um, foods to include in that commodities bundle um, instead of relying on USDA packages or USDA vendors um, in order to um, source that. So, and the USDA, um, you know, profile of available foods through that commodities program or food distribution program on Indian reservations has started including um, more uh, culturally relevant foods at the request of tribes. So we see wild rice, we see salmon, we see uh, bison. Um, we're hearing tribes requesting other foods like squash and beans that are a variety specific to their needs. Uh, but it's a really exciting time to see these, um, you know, when we call it FDIPR, Food Distribution Program and Indian Reservation. So if you hear me say commods or FDIPR, that's the same thing. Um, we see them source these um, really great foods and are able to offer them. And not only do they source them, you can target um, local indigenous producers oh, cool. to get them to grow the things that you want to include in that. So not only are you feeding people the right foods, you are able to support those indigenous producers in your community to return dollars to stay on your reservation or within your native community to encourage additional investment in tribal agriculture. So super exciting. We want to see this program made permanent in the next farm bill um, and an expanded offering of indigenous foods available, um, not only through the 638 programs, but also included on the USDA package bundle. So does this have anything to do with, um, I know I've heard from some nations that they've had to choose whether they would receive um, food benefits from the state or federal government or grow their own um, crops to feed their, their people and, and have their own local farming. And they've had to choose um, mm -hmm. one or the other. And oftentimes it's easier to take the federal funding um, and the, that federally provided nutrition rather than grow your own crops. Um, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I'm not specifically sure of the mechanism that would require the choice, but I do know that under a lot of tribes treaty provisions, we were encouraged to become agrarian or agriculturalist regardless of whether that was particularly relevant for us or not. And under that scenario, the Bureau of Indian Affairs theoretically would be um, involved in ensuring that resources were made available for that transition or to engage in that activity. And so um, that really hasn't happened very frequently. It hasn't happened successfully um, in most instances, but we're seeing a resurgence in tribes requesting, okay, BIA, this is in my treaty. You're supposed to be doing this for me, but you're not, so I'm going to do it myself. Um, I haven't heard of that specific scenario, but I could envision, um, you know, a discussion wherein it's either, you know, you take the BIA funding to grow your own or you leverage the nutrition programs, but I'm not necessarily familiar with the context that would precipitate that choice. So, so let's talk a little bit about some of the questions that we're getting in our chat right now have to do with, uh, from Lance and th thanks Lance. It's, it's good to see you there in the chat room on YouTube. Um, how we protect native seeds from non-Indians or others that uh, either may sell or commercialize these um, and alter them. Uh, do we need to patent them? Um, is there other genetic pollution that we're trying to protect our seeds from? Uh, I guess it's a question of sovereignty and ownership uh, of these indigenous seeds. Um, e either one of you, can you speak to that? Well, do you want to start, Carly? Go ahead. I'm not going to nerd out on the law stuff, but I think, um, mm -hmm. you know, from the on the ground um, perspective, I, I'd love for you to go first. Okay, on the ground. Well, I'd say on the ground, it's, it's mixed when it, the patent question comes mm -hmm. up of how do we protect this? What Lance is asking, many people are asking, how do we protect our seeds that are so valuable? And especially when you're in a situation where these seeds are often scarcely present. So it's if it would be one thing if they were fully vibrantly grown, consumed, and there, stockpiles of them. You know, but I think part of that conversation of the patenting and the, the desire to protect is coming out of a, partly a scarcity 
which is real, you know, not in all communities. Some communities have vi vibrant seed saving and, and um, seed banking going on, but not all. And so there is a desire to protect. Now, what I hear from the communities I work with, and um, I've been a teacher at the community called Tohono Odom Community College, and this was something we talked a lot about in class, patenting, and it was interesting because you had the older students who were against it. And the argument was this is antithetical to our way of viewing seeds, to our ideology, our belief system. This is what we're fighting, that people could do this patent. Whereas for younger people I found, and, and, and it varies, but overall younger folks with, well, let's utilize the tools. And they may be the tools of our oppressors, but this is what we need to use to protect ourselves. And this goes on often in law. So I'm sure Carly can speak more of it. It's like you learn the system to protect yourself. And we're always operating in those two worlds. And you have to decide what do you choose to take on and adopt so as to protect yourself? Or do you say, no, we're not even engaging in that ideology, that way of thinking or that means of protection because that's so against our worldview and our spiritual connection to the seeds. And that's a big discussion. I think there might be ways that we can still protect seeds, um, but it's a big conversation because even small scale farmers are dealing with this too. It's like there's a, a national initiative and a, an awakening and it's being led by native folks, it's being led by small scale farmers, native and non who are f facing the reality of, of patents and utility patents that are really against the act of seed saving, right? And so what are the tools we have available to protect that right um, that we would have to even just save the seed that we buy from us, from burpees or the company? Um, there's There are some initiatives to think about this, but I'll, I'll jump it over to Carly to hear from the law perspective. Sure. So when we talk about protecting native seeds from non-native people that might sell native seeds on the market, I'm not sure that we can necessarily always prevent that. However, there may be some safeguards available, um, like through um, indigenous certification. So if you're buying a seed that you know is an um, indigenous um, strain, that you seek a certification that it's Native American produced or there is a designation of genetic purity. Because frequently when we see people who are not, um, you know, looking at it through the lens of commercial viability versus a seed saving and um, health and cultural perspective, there's not as much um, consideration with regard to uh, the integrity of the product or the integrity of the seed. Mm -hmm. And so that can be, you know, something as, you know, the seeds that we use are certified internally through this particular process, either within your community or tribe, or maybe some sort of larger consortium. And an example of that, not necessarily from the seed perspective, but um, the Intertribal Ag Council offers a Native American produced foods designation. So if you are an indigenous producer that is, you know, putting food out onto the market and you want the distinction that this is a native product, you can um, get certified and use that label. Um, with regard to whether we want to patent our seeds or not, um, there is even some, you know, legal constraint with regard to whether or not you can actually patent just a seed. Um, you may be able to patent the technology used to develop that seed. You may be able to uh, patent um, any sort of breeding techniques associated to get that seed or production techniques. But there's still that legal question of can you actually patent a specific seed? Um, it even goes down to, um, a, you know, a, an inquiry as, well, what about DNA strands? Can you patent that or certain traits associated with that, especially as we look into, you know, expanded um, technology surrounding um, genetic modification. So that component of tribal sovereignty, each tribe needs to determine for itself um, what type of breeding technologies it wants to engage in or allow. Um, some tribes are fine with that. Some want to really focus on, um, you know, traditional breeding practices. And from a tribal sovereignty perspective, all of those perspectives are valid and we need to make sure that those opportunities um, are that. So 
from an IFAI perspective, we just want to make sure tribes are educated about the conditions and outcomes and, you know, potential challenges that may result with any of those decisions. Personally, I say don't patent it because the patent process is pretty invasive. You have to give up a lot of information with regard to, you know, what it is you're patenting, how you developed it. Um, and it's pretty, um, it, there's a lot of exposure that could be leaked. And so what I encourage a lot of communities to do is if you have a special seed or a special product that, you know, you want to keep sacred or you want to make sure is being cared for in a good way, um, keep that to yourselves. Like a lot of times we forget that, you know, not talking about something is okay. And as indigenous people, we know that, you know, knowledge isn't free um, and it's not a commodity. It's something that is earned and you share that information when you know that you can safely share that and it's going to be used in a good way and not exploited. And we've seen how um, not indigenous knowledge can be exploited and used against us in a historical context, especially. So um, that would be my suggestion. And, um, you know, seed banking opportunities are a really great way to do that. And then also seed saving networks love to see that, um, especially from a trade perspective. So you can preserve that um, without having necessarily engage in a commercial activity um, in like a cash for situation. Um, and, but I guess bartering could also be considered a commercial activity. Your trade could be considered a commercial activity. So, um, you know, just different networks on how to um, share those seed opportunities and how to protect them. And, and is it true that the, the patent process, um, you, you only own that patent for a certain length of time and then it's it's put back out into the public. So yes. you're basically sharing all of this information mm -hmm. and then um, 75 years or, or however long down the line, it's open up for anyone um, exactly. to access. What about- um, Coca-Cola is not patented. Say that again. But that's why Coca-Cola isn't patented. That recipe is kept internally and held very closely so that that doesn't get released later on um, to the public. So that works. So that kind of, of of protection works internally. That's what inherent sovereignty is all about. So what about um, tribal laws to help support that protection so that if, say, any other tribal citizens, tribal members want to, to remove it without authority, that it can still be protected um, internally? Has, has anyone worked on um, internal tribal laws and policies to help protect food. Yes. Yeah. Um, so our model tribal food and ag code has a specific section with regard to um, cultural food knowledge and um, give some examples of ways uh, different tribes have um, codified uh, seed saving or, you know, culturally relevant food protection. Um, it can look anything like, um, you know, you don't share any information about this, or you're only allowed to use this product within the reservation areas or within, you know, culturally sensitive specific locations. Um, it, there can be provisions where, you know, um, the tribe indicates that that product is not intended to be commercialized um, because, um, you know, different tribes have different perspectives about what agriculture means. I had a chance to talk with a gentleman from Hopi Nation and, um, he described to me that um, food is not intended to be commercialized. Agriculture products are not intended to be commercialized. Um, if you have excess, you can, you know, barter or trade with what you have, but it's, it's intended to be something that sustains um, your community and your family and yourself versus something to make money off of. So mm -hmm. just, even that different perspective alone, I think is incredibly unique to Indian country. And we realize we don't have to look at everything through an economic lens or through a commercialization lens or a revenue lens. Um, there are different investments that we can make in order to strengthen and sustain our community without seeing a, a dollar return necessarily. Yeah, Carly, I think it makes me think of the bill you you just mentioned before where there's support for buying from farmers within the community, how valuable that is. Because in our outreach efforts that's come up about how do we make farming economically viable for the young farmers in particular who want to be farmers. They need, they're like, we got cell phone bills. Maybe I wanna get my own place one day. I still need money, but I don't wanna commodify 
traditional crops. I don't want to commodify the things I'm growing. I want to feed my community is like, that's step one. Um, so if there are infrastructures in place to help support that, that's so wonderful to hear about because that's come up and often, you know, folks approach us of, hey, I've got a, a company and we're looking to commodify, you know, maybe there's some beans or there's, there's this interest in commercializing these traditional crops because they're beautiful. I get it. You know, they're unique, but there's pushback. And as an organization, we want to respect that very much so. So if it's all about feeding community, then that's the focus of the outreach towards and, and how do we link up schools or um, elderly homes or community garden and food distributions, mutual aid to make that happen is because uh, we hear that a lot. We're not trying to, to commodify this. Definitely. And that that's such a great perspective because you know, we, when we see federal um, agriculture policy, it has really been invested on like larger scale industry mm -hmm. for a long time. And we, you know, we've seen that food that looks pretty and ships good and doesn't get bruised, but it's nutritionally deficient. Mm -hmm. um, it has to travel a long way to get to wherever you're at. That's not necessarily the best fit for us. Um, but I've been really pleased um, to see that the current administration, especially in light of issues resulting from COVID and disruptions in our food supply chain, has recognized that there needs to be a targeted investment in local and regional food economies. And so, like you said, you know, how do you connect your product with, you know, institutional services like schools or hospitals or daycares or nursing homes or things like that? That's a really great um, market to enter into. Um, but there's also an initiative, and I, I'm encouraging tribes to do this when I have a chance to work with them, to you know, taking your um, agriculture operation to the next level through what we call value-added agriculture, which means you know next step up the supply chain. So if you have a raw corn product, maybe it looks like shucking it and you're selling just the crop. So you know, taking it one step further to make it a little bit easier for people to consume or from a raw product to a more finished product. Um, we're seeing tribes make the investment in that processing or packaging or labeling opportunity to allow them to retain a lot more of the value along that supply chain. And I'm encouraging tribes to open up those opportunities to their local and regional um, tribal producers so that they can have access because that, that equipment, it's expensive. Having a location for it, it's expensive. So if you have a hub where you can cooperatively share that processing opportunity, either at a free or reduced cost for your local producers, it makes retaining that value in your community so much more viable and makes it so much easier for somebody to be a small farmer or to be a medium sized farmer and grow those traditional um, food products in addition to whatever else you wanna produce. So um, that that's something I really wanna see is, um, you know, we've been subsidizing large scale agriculture for such a long time. There's no reason why we shouldn't be doing it for local mm -hmm. producers also very much so yeah and and what i'm hearing uh listening to you speak and thank you so much um uh, is there is a difference between indigenous food sovereignty and food sovereignty mm -hmm. that the values that um native nations bring to protecting our seeds and foods has to do with this value of, of sharing and that everyone has a right mm -hmm. to uh, be fed well and, and to be healthy, which is not a value shared mm -hmm. by just talking about food for commercial purposes, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and so this discussion um, is not just about getting good food for people to eat and oh you know we're so in we've got to go to whole foods right we're going to go to whole foods and we're going to get that special berry or seed from mm -hmm. from thousands and thousands of miles away because it helps us i don't know uh be more virile and strong um this is not about that this is about um being connected to place and the food that's adapted to that place in the in in the people that are there, right? It's it's a local, um, and it's about the values of of, of sharing, and human rights. So, um, uh, I, I find this subject matter um, fascinating, 
and it also makes me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I like pointed out, you know, that uh, food sovereignty um, is distinct from tribal food sovereignty. So food sovereignty is the ability of the community to um, engage in the food practices and feed itself, you know, the foods that um, it wants or needs, whatever mm -hmm. that is. Tribal food sovereignty in that context, and I always like to start it when we you know when we're talking about tribal food sovereignty is we cannot be truly sovereign if we can't feed our own people. Mm -hmm. Like that's number one. How are you sovereign if you can't feed your own people? You have to be able to, you know, produce or distribute or make available opportunities for your people to be fed, not just any food, but, you know, culturally relevant and healthy food that is sustaining and nurturing, not just from a nutritional perspective, but from a cultural and traditional perspective as well. And so when we think about it in that context, you know, you can't have tribal sovereignty, true tribal sovereignty, mm -hmm. unless you have food sovereignty as well. And from uh, my friend, uh, Laureen uh, Roy, uh, she just got back from her garden and she's battling it against the squirrels. Mm -hmm. So there's also the, the four leggeds that, that we get to uh, struggle with sometimes yeah. in, in, in growing. Uh, yep. Fencing is big. Fencing <laughs> is big. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's oh. For food safety in the field as well. You got to keep the. Right. That's yeah. true. Yes. Um, I was just going to add that with that distinction of tribal food sovereignty versus food sovereignty, a big difference I see is the ceremonial aspects and sacredness of seeds. And that is different than the larger American food sovereignty movement. So there are seed crops that we have at Native Seeds that were um, that all communities should have that are sacred to them. And that's to this is not happening. This is a total cultural difference where there is not a sacredness to a seed to a crop. They're not used ceremonially in the larger Western culture. And that's just a big, and that's a hard one for people to get over to that difference and that a plant can be um, sacred and the importance of it. But I think like Carly said, it's tied to culture, it's and it's tied to spirituality. So it's a, a whole deeper level that we're working to strengthen. You know, that that tie. Um, that's it's beyond just feeding people, it's feeding people spiritually as well. And that's really important. Uh, in in this work of food so tribal that's unique to tribal food sovereignty. Absolutely. Um, and, and Lance is asking another good question. So let's get into talking about climate change and the work of Indigenous food sovereignty. Um, uh, how is that affecting what you're doing? A lot yeah. of what we're doing, getting these seeds out, is really important for the climate adaptation and encouraging seed saving. So every year you go out your crop and you select those seeds, that those seeds experienced your soil, they experienced the weather, they are adapting each season you're growing and saving to that new climate. And so that's part of the problem with these underground, like Svalbard in Norway, under an iceberg, even though it's melting, ice, um, what do you call it? seed banks, is they're stagnant they're not adapting to climate change. So they're there kind of in this apocalyptic scenario where we'll have seeds one day just in case. But for adapting to climate change, that's a, an everyday, it's a current practice. So each season as growers are saving their seeds, they're adapting those seeds to the conditions of now that are ever changing. So seed saving, I'd say is a big part of climate adaptation great point what we see a lot um we have a lot of um of our stakeholders reach out to us and say can you help me with and yeah. in the context of climate change we're seeing a lot more extreme weather whether that's drought whether it's flooding um, much heavier rainfall um and even wildfires um secondary to drought so the exposure and risk associated with you know um these disaster scenarios is 
has been compounded by climate change and it makes it very difficult for these operations to be sustainable if you know half of your pasture is burned up and you have to sell off half your um, cattle herd in order or bison herd to um, be able to feed them because you just don't have anywhere to put them until you know that land recovers um, and I think that's an argument for traditional ecological knowledge and the application of um, natural resource management um, through those perspectives, because we know that um, controlled burns is a component to forest health and prairie health, uh, preventing you know additional fuel becoming available to create these really huge wildfires or prairie fires that are um, incredibly impactful. Instead of just you know doing a controlled burn at the right time of the year um, under the right weather conditions and managing that resource, um, you know versus something else and. And one of the things that I think tribes are really good at is um, we talk about agriculture. The mainstream definition is the you know cultivation of the soil in order to grow something or something like that. And the USDA has a restriction on it where it, you have to have a value of over a thousand dollars. Well, if you're doing wild harvest, that's not necessarily you putting a seed in the ground and cultivating it. It does look like you managing the natural resources in the area to encourage that natural production activity. And I'll give you an example. Some of the wild rice tribes up north, like in Michigan and Minnesota, um, don't necessarily go out and plant each wild rice um, seed. Mm -hmm. but part of their harvest practices includes not harvesting everything and allowing some of that additional seed to go back into the water. And in addition to that, they also manage the areas around um, those um, anomen, um ponds or lakes to have the right kind of um, trees or um, brush or undergrowth to really preserve the soil health and prevent unintentional leaching of, you know, chemicals or other types of undesirable things into that monoman lake. Uh, they also uh, use modern technology, um, like through uh, USDA conservation programs like EQIP or um, other things in order to install um, water level regulators. So you're managing the water level, you're managing the surrounding area to keep it healthy, you're engaging in harvest practices that are regenerative, um, but you're not actually planting a seed into the ground and watching it grow. Mm -hmm. To me, that's agriculture. That's a way to feed yourself. Um, and by managing the resource, even if you're not planting something, watering it, expecting it to grow and just really kind of tend it um, the way people might, you know, culture or traditionally think about what agriculture is. So mm -hmm. managing those natural resources is critical in order to, um, combat climate change, but also provide alternative opportunities for sustainability. Mm -hmm. Something I, I wonder about for, for traditional farmers is the, the missing out on USDA, particularly NRCS ecosystem service payments. And um, I know, know Michael Johnson, um, from Hopi has been working on this and advocating for this largely of like, hey, we're doing the practices, the regenerative practices, we're conserving water, we're building the soil health, yet where's our ecosystem service payment because we don't fit into your regimented and largely Western idea of what conservation agriculture looks like. And um, several of the farmers I've, I've had the pleasure to work with are, are similar in that boat of where they've been farming as as um, environmentally as one could and yet mm -hmm. are not getting the subsidy the subsidies that the big ag is getting for maybe putting in a cover crop or like switching to drip tape versus flood irrigation and um, that's something I it's Carly I can tell you're like on it so I'm, yeah. I'm curious to hear about so how we those producers that. Yeah, we need those producers to sign up to serve on regional tribal conservation advisory councils. We call them okay. RTCACs, and they advise the Natural Resource Conservation Service under USDA about which policies need to change um, or rules or regulations need to change with regard to the application of those laws to better fit indigenous communities. And that type of sustainable practice um, that's a component of traditional ecological knowledge is something that we hear and want um, our RTCAC participants to vocalize. Um, mm -hmm. Through the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative, we will be um, 
engaging in a cooperative agreement with NRCS to provide support, administrative support and travel support and coordination for these regional tribal conservation advisory councils to come together so that we can hear um, what needs to happen and what needs to change and make sure that NRCS receives that information and is able to incorporate it into their uh, practices and policies. Great. Yeah, it's Woo. needed. That's great to hear. Good. And and so let me remind everyone that, that uh, Carly is coming from the Indigenous Food and Agricultural Initiative. The website address is Indigenous Food and Ag dot com and that um andrea dr andrea carter is coming from native seed search which is native seeds dot org um i i want to bring up this this um statement from clary sage herbarium what a great name appropriate name uh and she's speaking to you andrea i love that Andrea, I will forever now grow and store my own seeds. I currently have been saving seeds from an especially yummy store-bought organic squash. Um, so is that, those are things that any of us can do wherever we are. If we go to a local local farm and, um, and try to kind of uh, take things that are especially good and, and, and try to grow and keep growing them, should we be coming to Native Seed Search to to buy seeds um, for our area? How how what can we um, do mm -hmm. to help um, with these issues of Indigenous food sovereignty? Great, I think all of the above and more. So you can certainly save that squash. For seed saving, when you're buying from a farmer, the big thing is that seed is mature enough. For example, if you get a red pepper versus a green pepper, that red pepper is just an, a green pepper is an unripe red pepper. So if you save the green pepper seeds, you will, they won't germinate. They're not fully developed yet. So there are some fruits and vegetables that when you consume them as food, the seeds are fully developed inside. That's like squash. Right, but for something like okra, for example, you're gonna harvest that a lot earlier for food than you would for seed saving. Because you want that, just like a baby, honestly, the similarities are wild, but the you want that seed to fully gestate, to fully develop inside the mother, right? It's an embryo that's developing. It's gotta stay there for as long as possible to get all the nutrients from the mother plant. And that's often beyond the point where you would want to eat it for food because it's tougher. But squashes are a great example of something you can get from the supermarket, uh, from a farmer's market and save that seed. If you are in the Southwest, by all means, reach out to Native Seed Search and get your 10 free seed packets. That's a lot of seeds within a packet to fill up your garden. So I highly encourage folks who are living in the Southwest or from Southwest tribes and living elsewhere to access those seeds um, and then save them and, and then build up your own seed bank. And, you know, we think often about climate change being this horror. It's a scary thing for sure, but there are these daily actions to build our own resiliency at the household and community level. And, and seed savings a, a really accessible way to do that because we're all eating food and all of that's coming from seeds and they're around us and we, we can access them. Um, there are other seed companies for sure out there that might have more regionally adapted varieties depending on your location. So I suggest looking into those um, and, and joining their often seed sovereignty networks. There's the Native American Food Alliance. There are groups and networks that are facilitating this exchange of seeds. Um, so get a packet from Native Seeds and adapt it to your environment. Select the ones that do well year after year. And I've got growers that will grow native seed, you know, the Southwest varieties outside of the Southwest because they're not putting in a lot of fertilizer, right? And maybe it's hot in an urban farm or the conditions are a little tough. And a lot of the resiliency that's associated with drought can also lend itself to resiliency in other ways, like a cold tolerance, for example. So it's worth adapting and, and starting to plant 
I encourage it and save your seeds. We've got some seed saving guidelines on our website. Uh, we do a, a seed saving book. There's some free educational materials on how to how to save your own seeds. So it's certainly doable. Excellent, Andrea and Carly. Uh, what can what can people do from from your perspective? As far as so I was um, really looking what Andrea was saying. Yeah, I, was like, <laughs> I, know, I know she was awesome. <laughs> um, uh, as, as far as um, uh, indigenous food sovereignty, how can how can we all help? Buy indigenous products from indigenous producers, and if you can buy them locally, even better. Um, I encourage people to really support um, you know indigenous food products, and there's some great stuff out there. We have uh, an annual uh, youth summit that we host every year to encourage native youth who are interested in becoming involved or continuing to be involved in uh, tribal agriculture and food and nutrition policy. Um, we and we had um, Chef Nico Albert from uh, mm -hmm. Cherokee Nation come in and uh, cook for us, and we all the ingredients were sourced from indigenous producers. So we had olive oil from Sika Hills, we had tepary mm -hmm. beans, um, we had uh, red corn pozole, and uh, you know different kinds of squashes from different producers wild rice uh, from Red Lake. And it was really great to get this, you know, box of food in the mail of all these really great indigenous products. So buy indigenous. If you don't know where to start, check out the Intertribal Ag Council's website, Native American Produced Foods. There's some really great options and you can order them online and they'll ship them straight to your house. Um, and I would also encourage you to start talking about food sovereignty in your community and with your tribe and your tri tribal leadership. What are we doing to promote food sovereignty? You know, do you have any ideas? What's what's our culture around food and how can we, you know, encourage that and encourage people to become engaged in that? And I have a friend who's a tribal counselor for uh, Cherokee Nation. And uh, he always says, when we meet, we eat. So let's uh -huh. eat. <laughs> That's beautiful. And I think that might be a beautiful way to end our conversation. Andrea, Carly, is there anything else we need to talk about that we missed about this topic? You all have both been so wonderful. Uh, I just want to give a plug for the Native Farm Bill Coalition. Um, Farm Bill 2023 is coming up. We're going to be spending the next year working really hard to continue to make uh, changes and encourage programs to serve Indian country agriculture. Um, so if you have any ideas or you want to participate or your tribe wants to sign up, check out, uh, if you just Google Native Farm Bill Coalition, it'll come up. Or you can reach out to us um, at indigenousfoodandag.com and we'll tell you how to get involved. Um, we want to hear your ideas. We want your feedback. We want to hear what's working for you. And we want to hear what kind of struggles or challenges you're facing, um, whether it's, you know, access or implementation or, uh, you know, being competitive uh, for funding. So let us know. We want to hear from you. Beautiful. Andrea, anything else? Um, I would just add that, again, seeds, start a garden. I encourage you to do so. There are resources out there. And if you have land available and want to be a partner gardener and a farmer with native seeds, by all means, reach out and, and participate in this and, and support um, seed sovereignty in your community and others that we can help one another in this effort and and that's the the goal building a network of indigenous producers that are growing traditional crops for food and our and our future so wow. wow yeah you all have been just absolutely i don't use the word lovely but <laughs> i'm, I'm kind of old and so you all have been just so lovely <laughs> all um, right you, you are, you're both really wonderful. This has been an incredible show. And I, I want to thank you both for your, your time and energy with us tonight. Um, I hope it's been uh, useful for those out there in uh, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter land. Um, and please, let's not stop here. Let's keep talking about these issues. Um, uh, let us know um, if the Association on American Indian Affairs can help or put you in touch with um, Andrea or, or Carly. Um, this has been a, a great show and, and both. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I'm going to say good night to you all and, and close up the show. Thank you, Shannon. Shannon. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Wonderful. Wow. Um, 
great show tonight. I hope you all thought the same. Again, I want to remind you um, that uh, Carly's uh, uh, work and website is at indigenousfoodandag.com and that Andrea Carter, Native Seed Search, is nativeseeds.org. And I'm also going to remind each of you all to apply for a scholarship, attend our repatriation conference. You'll see me there. You'll see Colleen there. You'll see Kim. You'll see all sorts of people. We'll be having keynote speaker uh, Suzanne Schoen Harjo, keynote speaker Marge Bruchak, uh, keynote speaker Sonia Adelay. Sonia Adelay has been a uh, um, a guest here on Red Hoop Talks, and 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 maybe some other familiar faces. Um, looking forward to seeing you there. And until next time. Uh, this has been Red Hoop Talk. I want to thank all of you for join us, joining us out there. I want to thank our ancestors and our future ancestors. Um, and uh, remember that you are sacred and that together we can make a difference. Good night, everyone. Now, okay, you guys got to, I can never do this smoothly, right? So um, let me um, uh, get this right and then I'll close this out. One day I'll, I'll get the, the closing ceremony here. Okay. Good night. Bye.